Welcome everybody. My name is Jenny Pearson. I'm an Education Officer for the Primary Health Network. Um, before we go any further, I'd like to um, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on today and pay respect to Elders past and present. I'm coming to you from Awabakal land in beautiful Newcastle. Um, our uh, webinar today is Chronic Pain, the Patient Journey, Opioid Prescribing, Deprescribing and the Whole Person Approach. Our presenters today are from the Hunter Integrated Pain Service. We have Dr. Andrew Powell, who's a specialist pain medicine physician, Laura Brugnick, who's a pain physiotherapist, and Fiona Hodson, who's a clinical nurse consultant. We also have the lovely Michelle Redford with us, who's going, who is a GP, and she will be facilitating the Q&A at the end of the presentation. Uh, today's session is being recorded and will be available on our website in the Education Library that you can access later, along with a copy of the slides. Uh, this is session one. Session two is next Wednesday at 12 o'clock. It is recommended that you attend both uh, to get the, the full information um, for yourself. Um, so keep an eye out uh, for that link. I will email it out again if anybody's missed it. All right, thanks very much, uh, Andrew. I'll hand over to you. Uh, thank you very much and welcome everybody and uh, allowing us time to speak today about a topic that is very uh, important to everyone in the community particularly uh, and that's chronic pain and how we approach that which is what we call a whole person approach. Um, just doing a um, once again I just would like to acknowledge the traditional uh, custodians of the land and uh, that's the Wobbical people that we are meeting on today and pay our respects to uh, elders past and present and emerging. Uh, on the screen there is a depiction there from a uh, an Aboriginal uh, elder who is experiencing chronic pain and this is uh, her representation which is something that we uh, hold quite a lot of value in when we are presenting to patients. It's outlining uh, several uh, very strong emotional and exper experiential uh, sides to her story and she's depicted this nicely uh, and as you can see there that um, it's a, a complex and interwoven uh, uh, experience of pain which is what we're going to as part of today explore a little bit more about our understanding of pain and then the following session will then take it further in how we uh, wish to in some ways um, uh, acknowledge the difficulties of the tertiary and primary interface and then how we are collaborating towards uh, a patient's well-being and outcome who experiences chronic pain. Um, this, this program has, has come about uh, uh, realising that chronic pain is a, uh, a prevalent um, I suppose process or experience in our community, one in five. And um, with uh, chronic pain is that we've looked at ways of, um, of identifying weaknesses or areas where patients, uh, I suppose, have find barriers to uh, engage in a recovery program. And that was uh, uh, identified through the, uh, the Hunter New England Integrated Care Partnership uh, looking at uh, four or five, four areas really, which is the accessibility, the affordability, the awareness, and activation. Uh, these areas are uh, areas that we identified as being primary key barriers and potential points where patients experiencing chronic pain in our community uh, do find difficulties accessing the uh, recovery support uh, and information. And they're the areas that we uh, hope to continue working towards to facilitate patients recovery. Uh, the option, the, sorry, the objectives to the session today, so this is session one, and I'm going to just to uh, explore a bit about the whole person approach for chronic pain, that's non-cancer chronic pain patients, discuss medications, particularly around opioid and cannabis, cannabis 
And then following on, uh, Laura will discuss uh, the interdisciplinary care, including allied health and nursing roles. So, uh, HIPS and how we uh, are endeavouring to develop programs within HIPS to help patients uh, in our community and also help GPs. Um, because we know that this is a difficult uh, process that patients are experiencing, but also it affects their family members, their loved ones, but also the community which is trying to care for them because everyone wants to help as best they can. The issue becomes when people are dealing with a difficult process, um, uh, it often transfers across to uh, the healthcare workers as well, and they find it very, sometimes very overwhelming dealing with people's uh, severe chronic pain or helping support them. Uh, at HIPS, if you refer a patient to HIPS, um, what we have noticed over the years is that patients typically waited a long time. And in that waiting process, often were stalling or not uh, you could say progressing. So what HIPS has done is introduced a seminar as a first step. So when patients get referred, they are invited to a seminar that it, what we call is the introduction to HIPS, which is more of a welcoming seminar. It takes about an hour. And then from that, the patients are given the opportunity to advance further with our team to an assessment stage, or they can decide to not advance further, take away the information they have and go to their GP or allied health professionals in the community and discuss what they would like to do around managing chronic pain or recovering from chronic pain. And that would be a GP contact pathway. So patients coming to the service attend a introductory to HIPS and then they elect to go on to further assessment with HIPS or then go down towards a GP contact and discharge from HIPS. At the introduction to HIPS, our role initially is to welcome patients, but also to give a, a bit more information, hopefully not too much, but allow patients to um, be validated that their pain is real. And what we do know is that pain, or when I was at a junior uh, medical institution, institutions, I was often referred to pain as being, or was taught to pain being super tentorial as well as nociceptive, which we know is incorrect. We know that pain is experienced by the person and with functional MRIs, we know that the brain does change. The spinal cord, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system change with people experiencing chronic severe ongoing pain. The pain system is, is a term that we use to incorporate all the components, you could say, to a person's pain experience. And they predominantly include the central nervous system, but also there's other um, systems, you could say, that are equally influenced, if not, um, you could say, reciprocating a process. So that's the immune system and the hormone system as well. The pain system, it is a system that was evolved over many years to identify dangers and safeties. It's meant to protect us. But what we do know now is that the pain system can be escalated up or overwhelmed or overactive. In a sense, it becomes more sensitized. And this is a depiction here that the pain system being wound up. And the wound up can be produced by many different stimuli. So pain we know can come on as a insult or a trauma, but also pain can come on spontaneously. And the pain system is the predominant feature there that is escalating up and down or fluctuating the pain experience of the patient. Now this happens in acute pain as well as chronic pain, but it seems that once the pain is experienced for long periods of time, the pain system seems to be the most predominant um, activator is the most predominant feature that we need to target to help people recover from chronic pain. So the pain system has this ability to wind up. That's the nervous system, the immune system, the hormone system. And also it has the ability to wind down. 
And that's something that's very important. In the past, people were told, oh, listen, you just have to put up with it. But what we do know now is that people can recover from chronic pain. An example of this is, um, uh, this is a depiction or, uh, sorry, a, uh, a slide of a patient who has been experiencing chronic rheumatoid pain and uh, she has undergone a left lower limb amputation. Um, this patient before the amputation uh, was experiencing painful swollen stiff ankles. Uh, after the, the operation, she continued to experience a painful swollen stiff left ankle. Now, uh, we know this as being, of course, phantom pain, but how does this phantom pain relate to what we're talking about now is that it seems that when you do functional MRIs, the pain centers within the central nervous system, but more overall, the pain system has been, you could say, aroused or stimulated or wound up. And what we do know, the way to treat this is not obviously to work on a part of the body that doesn't exist, but to work on the pain system itself. The pain system has um, cues that allow us to, to uh, facilitate winding it slowly down and bringing around a change in the pain experience. And often it can go down towards pain experience of zero. Um, not everyone, but I would say that um, without a focus on the pain system, the recovery potential of the patient is being stagnated. Um, other areas that we have, you would say, come to realize as being uh, in the past uh, somewhat overutilized. This is an example of an MRI scan of someone's lower back. In the scan, the MRI is depicting a bulging disc down lower in the MRI scan. And often, if a patient presented to the emergency department or a medical service and has lower back pain and has a scan, often these scans can show these uh, defects or you could say changes in their structure. And the normal, you'd say, rationale would be pointing towards the bulging disc as being the cause of the lower back pain. However, with ongoing operations, not providing a clear resolution in the pain, studies have indicated that, oh, that the process, pain process may not be related to the bulging disc. In other words, other studies have shown that people in the ages of 50 or over with no back pain, 80% of those people have bulging discs, or sorry, 6% have bulging discs or disc bulge, and 80% have disc degeneration. In other words, it is very common as we get older to have these structural changes in the spine or in the body, and the pain does not exist for most people. However, some people can have severe pain in their lower back and have completely normal spine. So there's other things, or you could say there seems to be more complex. There's more involved to the pain experience than the single structure. And that's where it comes back to, once again, that the pain system is more important. You could say the tissues do heal, the pain system remains wound up and sensitized. And therefore, like the patient who has the amputation, we direct our treatment towards the pain system winding down and getting balance rather than the structure itself. So what's the role, um, you could say, of the doctor? Um, fortunately, here around the Hunter New England area, our experience is that GPs do an excellent job at managing and ruling out red flags. What I mean by red flags is if pain is meant to be a warning sign or alarm sign, it's important that we do rule out red flags to reassure, to reassure the patient is safe. If the patient remains alarmed, that they don't feel safe, then there is no chance for that patient to progress towards a recovery. So that's where we ask the patients, am I safe to move into recovery? If a patient remains uncertain about their safety, they often find themselves going around a medical roundabout, we call it. In other words, they seem to come back and back and then there's more investigations, there may be more procedures, but the patient is stalling in the medical system without 
exiting towards the recovery phase. And that's often related to patients being very, very worried about the pain, which then can heighten the pain system. So the pain system changes. The pain, pain system is, uh, is wound up and wound down by many, you say, thoughts, activities, nutrition, uh, many aspects of one's, uh, you could say, lifestyle. Uh, and it's very important then to look at ways of what activities and thoughts wind both up the pain system, but also looking at things that wind down the pain system. Um, one of the examples that we do use in the welcoming seminar to HIPS is we use a practice point where we get the patients to uh, sit quietly in a chair and to just breathe on, uh, sorry, to acknowledge or recognize their breathing process. And that's where we get them to sit quietly in a chair with the feet grounded and then slowly relax the muscles from their feet up to their knees and up to their hips. And then looking at their diaphragm and their tummy and just witnessing the breath come in, the breath to come out and to slowly relax and wind down, you could say, the agitation and the tension within their muscles, as well as their nervous system and their pain system. Often people report in the room changes to their pain experience just with that simple process. And with that acknowledgement that the pain system is flexible and plastic, there's many other strategies that can be introduced to a patient's recovery plan. But obviously it requires the patient to undertake that, which is another significant point. Uh, so a whole person approach to chronic pain looks at the broader approaches. We use a five finger approach. Part of this is the biomedical, which is often overrepresented in our community is in that people have been utilizing biomedical treatments and focus quite a lot without balancing it with the, what we would say, the mind body, the connection, activity and nutrition. All components are equally important. And if without balance, the patient isn't given the opportunity to recover to their best potential, which they deserve. It is different to acute pain treatment. Acute pain treatment often involves a process where the body repairs and the pain system winds down as the body tissues heal. However, in chronic pain, the pain system often remains quite elevated and wound up. And therefore, medicines typically don't have the opportunity or they tend to become more resistant or the patient develops, you could say, tolerance and side effects build, but the pain continues on. So that there is a difference between the approach to acute pain compared to chronic pain, which we will look at a little bit now. Um, so when it comes to the biomedical phase for chronic pain, is typically we utilize medications as well as other biomedical procedures. I'm just gonna talk a bit about medications um, medicines that are typically used or have been referred to in the past, paracetamol, non-steroidals, opioids, cannabis, nerve pain medications, which include, as uh, we all know, some of the gabapentinoids, uh, anti-epileptics, um, antidepressants, and as, as well as self-medicating, such as some people utilize other uh, chemicals to address their distress and pain, such as alcohol. Um, the question becomes, which we ask the patients, is, is how well do they work? The issue is, is that often medicines do have some place or role in pain management. Typically, it's more towards the acute pain management. After a period of time, most, if not all, those medicines uh, lose their benefit. Um, the... However, there, there is a lot of longer term medication problems. Uh, so it seems that over a period of time at the start, medications for pain 
provides some benefit with lesser side effects, but with time, that balance typically starts to become a little bit lopsided towards the other way. And certainly the problems with medications are, start to escalate. Uh, what are they? As, as most people are aware of, there's some common ones such as uh, constipation, weight gain, foggy thinking. Um, there is also a impact on motivation. Uh, falls and osteoporosis is common, particularly as uh, our reserves as we age become um, more depleted. The other issue is pain and more pain and death. So death is a, uh, a study over in Canada has highlighted that a patient who's on higher opioids has a six-fold increase risk, six times more increased risk of death compared to a patient who is not on opioids. But the other thing too, which has become more, you would say, prevalent in the recent years is the opioid medicines actually start to cause more pain. So that's initially happened uh, more obvious in uh, people prescribed long-term opioids with the drug and alcohol service with methadone, but even in acute pain with remifentanil, uh, people who have done trials, they're looking at high dose remifentanil for a few hours and then testing the pain sensitivity afterwards. It has shown that the patient's sensitivity to pain or their ability to manage pain becomes a lot less. In other words, pain, pain stimuli are perceived as a lot larger than if they were not sensitized. So opioids in itself, after a period of time, start to sensitize the nervous system. And there's sexual dysfunction as well. Um, and as well as you could say, withdrawals and tolerance and addiction. So what's our role here at HIPS? Uh, part of our medical role is looking at ways to um, uh, facilitate the patient moving from, from a uh, more of a, a biomedical focus and to allow room for the other pillars of someone's health, which is the mind-body connection, activity and nutrition, to, to weight those up and allow the biomedical processes or interventions to start subsiding, to bring some balance to a whole person approach, in other words. Um, so we support people and patients into slowly and gently reducing pain-related medications with the view of reducing the side effects and to implement a, uh, a, a you would say, other processes or other activities and strategies to take the weight and act as their main source of um, recovery. So that's with allied health support, as well as the nursing staff uh, and um, other support people in our community. So this has coincided with, uh, or in terms with the policies over the last five years from uh, the Australian government. And that all started back in 2018 with the change to the coding. Uh, up scheduling of this codeine. And then later on, the, as you can see on the slide there, the TGA as well as SafeScript have all identified issues with ongoing pain related medications and the significant harm that they can produce. And also the lack of benefit that they are not providing. So it's become quite obvious from our point of view that there, there is an, an ongoing issue with, within our community with how to balance uh, the treatment for chronic pain. Uh, and that's what something of the whole person approach is trying to identify. The changes have been noted, particularly from our, uh, the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare, is that over the past few years, there's been a dramatic decrease in dispensing rate nationally. Um, and also there's 30% reduction in, in overall volume of opioids dispensed on any given day. In other words, uh, this seems to be trans, well, transgressing out into the community, this, this acceptance from the uh, national bodies, uh, which, which is important and uh, is saving lives and how to replace the current community's expectation around pain management is to utilize a whole person approach. 
Um, where's the evidence regarding this whole person approach? Uh, so as part of a pain clinic, we are involved with EPOC, which is a uh, electronic um, database that we all uh, subscribe to, most of the pain centres around Australia and New Zealand. And it's this is a study that was done in 2021, uh, which indicate that uh, people who attended a pain clinic uh, and persisted through the pain treatment programs, they identified that people who came away or come off all opioids did better than people who came down by 50% and they did better than people who did not reduce any opioid medication. In other words, it seems to imply that when people move towards a, a whole person approach or you could say utilizing other strategies supplied by allied health professionals and moving away from a biomedical frame, that they seem to do a lot better. Now, obviously this is people who are accepting and engaging with the service, which is another step I, I recognise is that one of our difficulties here is that often patients are not ready to engage with this process, and that's where communicating with uh, the with professionals, uh, with ourselves, and with the community about how do we get people more engaged with this process, uh, and allowing them to have an opportunity to come, but also having confidence that this does work when people undertake this program. Um, so, regarding the other issues that are current at the moment, uh, cannabis is a very predominant um, discussion in the pain clinic with regards to patients wanting information around cannabis and pain treatment. The recommendations from the uh, pain faculty uh, indicate that it's not recommended for chronic pain treatment. There's a study here in 2018 looking at 47 randomised controlled trials as well as 57 observational studies. The number needed to treat to get a 30% pain reduction was 24 to get one person to have a pain reduction of 30%. Number needed to harm was six. Um, the pain intensity change on a 100 millimetre visual analog scale was three millimetres. In other words, it's very, very small. Um, there was no improvement in physical or emotional functioning. And most of the, uh, the improvements around sleep seem to be regarding low quality evidence. In other words, it doesn't seem to be providing uh, the benefit that some people were hoping for. And from our experience as well is that it doesn't, most people identify that it doesn't seem to help with their pain treatment. Um, there is uh, a, obviously as a THC component increases in the product because most of the cannabinoids that are prescribed to people that have different elements of THC to CBD ratios, the higher the dose uh, obviously causes more cognitive impairment. And that most likely is uh, somewhat like, you could say, other chemicals like alcohol that suppress the system, which isn't really a good outcome in the long run for patients wanting to recover from pain treatment. I'll hand over to Laurie. Thanks, Andrew. Hi everyone, as I'm sure was said at the start, my name's Laura, Laura Bruhink, and I'm a pain physiotherapist I'm working here at Hunter Integrated Pain Service, and I've uh, worked in the past in private practice as well. So Andrew's been talking about the pain system and uh, I guess the biomedical side of things. So I wanna talk now about the mind-body, the connection, activity and nutrition, and I guess the role of allied health, but also things that everyone can kind of be aware of and, and implement to some degree. So if we talk first about mind-body. So in the medical system, we think of the mind and the body as two separate things, but this is really quite a, a false dichotomy. You know, as I sit down here to present today, I feel both excited and also nervous. And for me, that means I can feel my heart kind of really beating. I feel a bit kind of jittery, have a bit of a dry mouth. 
and that's a feeling in my mind, nervousness, but it's expressed in my body. Someone else might feel butterflies in their tummy or have to run to the toilet a few different times, so it can be expressed in different ways, but the mind and the body are very much integrated. They're not two separate systems. This is really important when it, become, when it comes to pain and particularly to chronic pain. So there can be many, I guess, emotions and thoughts or feelings linked in with the experience of pain. And it can also link back to a patient's beliefs. So primarily their belief around what is causing the pain or their beliefs around what they are safe to do. Um, fear, of course, is a very big one as well, whether it's fear of the pain itself or fear of damage or fear of the future. And we know that there's certain thinking patterns that do predispose people to uh, developing chronic pain or to making it difficult engaging in recovery. And they're mostly around uh, worry or rumination or catastrophizing thought patterns. Trauma is very common in people who experience chronic pain as well. And that can be something to, you know, definitely keep in mind, but it doesn't mean that we have to go kind of digging. So one little comment uh, there on the slide, on the picture, just says, what else was happening when pain began? How can we help people to start to make some of these links between the mind and body, beliefs, thoughts and feelings, and their experience of pain and noticing that connection so that they can start to work with it. Uh, sleep is another area in the mind-body um, section that we tend to target, but that also can very much be targeted at the primary care level. So that's looking at sleep hygiene, how changing habits over time can improve sleep, because we know that people who have poor quality sleep are more likely to experience chronic pain and to experience worse pain. So treating someone's sleep hygiene can actually improve their pain. And so linking into what I just said before about trauma, so I guess people with uh, people experiencing chronic pain, what we might see uh, in the clinic or what we might see in the community is they're experiencing a lot of pain, they might have limited function, they might be quite distressed, but often that's just the tip of the iceberg. Often below that is a long history of perhaps a difficult childhood, perhaps things that have happened to them over the years. Um, and that again is not to say that that's something that needs to be kind of explored in all kind of appointments. In fact, we would caution against that, that you really need to have trust in someone's permission to go asking about these things. But it's really important to remember that many of these people have these experiences and that that's where they're, they're coming from. Related to that too, I guess Andrew's talked about, is the patient ready to move into a recovery phase? And we also need to think about, is the patient actually capable of moving into that recovery phase? Are they capable of engaging in treatment at the moment? If someone doesn't have, you know, kind of safe, secure accommodation, for example, it's gonna be impossible for them to engage in treatment. So sometimes the first step might actually be looking at those kind of basic safety and physiological needs and making sure that those are addressed before they're going to be capable of engaging. The next area is connection. You know, it's the middle finger, it's argu arguably the linchpin of all of this. You know, by connection, we need connection to, to people, social connection, as well as to place, so to country or to culture, and also to having purpose in one's life. We know that disconnection hurts. We know that on those functional MRI scans, it looks pretty much the same as pain and that many people with chronic pain are experiencing loneliness, tension in relationships and lack of meaningful life roles. And I think, you know, everyone's well agreed that those are things to move towards, that they're often goals of pain recovery and pain treatment is moving towards healthier relationships, moving towards more meaningful life roles. But as well as being goals, they're actually part of the treatment itself. So reconnecting, and that can be on a very gradual basis, is part of recovery and well-being. So activity. What do we mean by activity? So I guess the first thing there, which relates back to what Andrew was talking about, is safety versus danger. Does the person feel safe to move? Do they feel safe to engage in physical activity? Because if they don't feel safe to start that journey, it's very unlikely it's gonna get very far. 
So talking about people's beliefs, but also challenging their beliefs gently, perhaps through experience as well, can be really, really powerful. So the types of activities that can be helpful include cardiovascular, which might be a daily walk, for example. It might be strength-based activities like resistance training. It might also be mindful movement. By mindful movement, I'm talking about any kind of slow, gentle movements that focus on the breath, that allow the person to kind of self-regulate in that moment, while at the same time, it's gradually exposing them to feared or challenging movements. So in the past, we used to use terms like stretching, but stretching kind of implies that there's something wrong with the body that we need to fix. Whereas this is more about starting to challenge uh, people's beliefs about their body through their experience. Can we stay kind of calm and relaxed, but also start to bend forwards, for example? So I think everyone is kind of in agreement that gradually increasing physical activity is really important for general health and that when it comes to pain, you know, we know that exercise can produce analgesia. We know that getting stronger helps someone become more functional. But the other really important part to consider is that gradually starting to do these feared movements can help to change these safety and danger beliefs and help them to really engage more broadly in getting back to life. All right, we've been doing a lot of talking at you, so we're going to do a little bit of moving. So sitting in your chair, I want you to have both your feet flat on the floor. Just be mindful if you're on a wheelie chair that you don't kind of fly away. If you feel safe and capable to have a go, what I want you to do is cross your arms over your shoulders, over your elbows, I should say, and I want you to stand up and sit back down as many times as you can while I time for 15 seconds. So. Ready, set, go. Standing up and sitting back down again. So I want you to keep going as often, as many as you can for 15 seconds. Just keep a little number in your head. You're up to 10 seconds. Almost there, 15 seconds and stop. Well done, thanks everyone. Hopefully you all got the blood pumping a little bit and warmed up a little bit. This is my ode to the sit to stand. The physios who are listening in will already be on board with this, but this is one of the simplest, quickest tests of someone's function that you can do there and then uh, in the clinic or in, in an appointment or even in a pharmacy. So I guess the first question, if it was a patient, would be can they do one without using their arms? If they can't, you've already got a pretty clear picture that their function is very, very limited. They're probably quite weak um, and they might perhaps fear movement as well. If they can do one, the next bar would be how many, you know, can they do five in that 15 seconds? So everyone's just given that a go. You've got a, some sense of how many you could do. If someone can't complete five in that 15 seconds, they're at a much higher risk of having a fall. And again, that's going to be a very clear area that you might want to target in terms of gradually increasing their physical activity. If they can do five, the next step quite simply would be how many can they do in a minute? So it's a very easy test to repeat. It goes straight into the training, which might be, you know, if someone could only do five today, all right, can you practice three? Three times a day, gradually increase it by one repetition each week. It's also very, very safe. You know, if someone is going to the toilet by themselves, they're already doing a sit to stand in their general life. So it's really applicable to almost all patients. Then the last area in that kind of whole person five finger approach would be nutrition. Uh, nutrition is probably, I guess, the least researched area, although it is becoming more so in recent years, which is really great to hear because it's obviously so, so important. And I've put the word multimorbidity on that slide because we know that people experiencing pain are usually experiencing it in the midst of many other chronic conditions, diabetes, heart disease, um, all those kinds of things. So we know that a diet that has more uh, variety of natural whole foods is going to be more likely to help wind down that pain system, help with any metaflammation that might be in the body. And here we often tend to go for the two lowest hanging fruit, which would be the gradually reduce or eliminate sugared beverages, sugary drinks, and increase um, intake of vegetables. Water, of course, is going to be the best option for your drink, and the other ideas can be around healthy swaps. 
So I'm a little bit aware of the time, so I'm going to just uh, keep on going through. So we've also just put in a separate slide around the principles of the nurse role. So as we've gone through those five fingers, there's obviously certain allied health professionals that can help to support people in those different areas, because we absolutely recognise that a lot of this stuff is, is simple, but it's not easy. So people tend to need support. And one of the great things about all my nursing colleagues is the breadth of their kind of knowledge and experience. So nurses can be really helpful um, in kind of supporting and connecting with both patients themselves and the other health professionals involved across these really broad range of, of five areas. So they can be there to help support these active strategies and behaviour change, you know, to keep accountable, to really reinforce the key messages. That is really key, that everyone's singing from the same songbook. Um, and next week in the case conferencing, there'll be a little bit more talk around some of that stuff and that they can be involved in the care plans as well. Um, we do have a bit of a summary in patient friendly language of this approach up on our website. So you can download that off there. We find that can be a good place to start sometimes to show people this and start to work our way through. And there's also lots of other resources available. So these slides will be um, available later, so I'll keep going through. The other resources we have are community health pathways. So there is the chronic non-cancer pain pathway, and there's also chronic opioid use and deprescribing pathway. And then I'm just going to pass back to Andrew to sum up. Thank you very much, Laura, for that. Um, so just as a summary, um, pain pain does, the evidence shows as pain can, people experiencing chronic pain, sorry, do recover and can recover with a whole person approach. Um, the, the key messages that uh, we often communicate with patients as well as to ourselves is that um, use a whole person approach, uh, good outcomes are possible, but it does take time. Uh, certainly takes a lot of support around the person to maintain confidence, consistency, because we all have ups and downs. And that's where the support of the HIPS team is we do not fix someone's pain. We support people fixing their pain experience. Uh, and behaviour change, it's simple, but it's not easy, as we all know from our own experience in life. Uh, the second session, which will be held on the Wednesday, the 28th of June, between 12 and 1, uh, the topics will include a case study, case conferencing experiences, um, as well as other professional development opportunities. Uh, and I believe that leads us to uh, a question time. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew and Laura. That's great. Thanks for um, such a comprehensive overview. We have got a few questions. I hope I'm allowed to just ask a couple of my own first, if that's OK. Certainly. Um, so I suppose I'm interested from a GP perspective of what sort of proportion of people that have referred to HIPS would, you know, would opt to go forward with a full assessment with HIPS. You know, what sort of what sort of rates would you see? Have you got a handle on that? Yes, approximately. Uh, this is a, a rough handle, and obviously the the numbers of uh, referrals change from year to year. However, I would say roughly, uh, when people are referred by their GP, only fifty percent of people attend. That's the number one thing. After the first initial assessment, I mean, sorry, information session, then another fifty percent of people choose not to engage with HIPS. So there's a fifty percent drop off initial from the referral who don't attend, and then another fifty percent drop off again after the assessment stage, and people electing to go through to a active program, a treatment program. Once again, there's a significant drop off, say another fifty percent. So that's that's one of the issues that we recognise is that um, uh, this program uh, is not right for everyone at this particular time. However, we are aware that over a period of time, I have seen people who do not engage initially, who didn't come back later on and do engage very, very well. So th th we are here, we, we are in a service that does not in, in some ways discharge people, but we recognise people do take time and this process does uh, require uh, an, an, 
a development of confidence from the patient side of things. So that's and, that answer that. And, mm. Yeah, thank you. And mm. so for us in primary care, are there things that we can do to sort of help the person get the most out of that process? You know, are there th you know what tips have you got for somebody in primary care considering a referral to HIPS? Um, I would say that uh, the main thing is to be upfront with the patient. Uh, obviously, uh, identifying that the patient is is number one safe. Uh, that that would be a primary thing there. I think to get the patient to look at, okay, if I'm safe, what, what what's going on with me? Those questions are very important for the patient to ask because that then opens up them to receive, you could say, newer information. When a patient is under a strong belief, as Laura was saying, and they have particular ideas around how they should recover, often those patients require a certain journey that they undertake. And then from that experience, they may elect then to go, oh, this isn't working. And often patients we notice who are really open to change reach rock bottom. And so that's where I think as a GP, uh, identifying the patient is, is where they're at. Are they safe? Are they open to engage with this pathway? And providing some information there, whatever you can, such as Laura providing a leaflet there about this is what the treatment for chronic pain is, would be one option. Uh, the the other thing that we do notice here is that, um, you know, which GPs do very, very well is, is you know identifying okay what's the patient's beliefs you know, how can we change these slowly with time and then engaging them with the right persons in their community pain uh, pain can be treated by many many different people it just requires the um, the patient to be open and an opportunity for a sport person to be there and I guess as you know we have continuity of care and that longitudinal view then you know hopefully we are well placed to start to identify some of those things that that Laura mentioned, you know, below the waterline and the iceberg and start to address those, I guess. Yes, 100%. Yeah. Uh, we know that uh, we don't know the patient uh, and we are uh, relying on the, the, the knowledge and the expertise of the general practitioner who care for the patient to help guide us where we can facilitate a opportunity for this person to recover. Uh, the most important person in treatment is the GP. Uh, we know that without the GP and, and someone who's engaged with the patient, th there is very limited opportunity for us to, uh, you know, help, you could say, or support the person. And there's mm. that, that key role as well, as Laura mentioned, for allied health, which I know a number of patients have difficulty affording in the, in the community. Um, through HIPS, you do have a dedicated allied health team. Is, is, that, is that correct? So there is some... Um, um, I don't know if you yes. could expand on that maybe a little bit. So so part of the uh, initially upfront that it's more of a nursing and medical engagement there and that's where we notice to help we facilitate the redirecting of patients towards the allied health programs that are provided here but also in the community. So the allied health team uh, uh, there is a uh, three physiotherapists as well as uh, dietitian, uh, three psychologists, uh, psychiatrists, uh, nursing staff. Um, so they're, they're all the allied health experts that are here. But also uh, another important thing we do know is that patients aren't able to attend HIPS because of distances and other restrictions, parking in particular, that um, the allied health team are very interested in supporting allied health members in the community to help with supporting patients with chronic pain. So that would be something that the team here are, are very eager to um, help people and expand this knowledge in the community, which I think there's a lot of very good practitioners out there who do a very, very good job already. Um, but there is that component of some people feel like, oh, this is a complex patient, I'm not too sure, and just get reassurance from the experts here uh, helps to, uh, you know, facilitate that calming down and, and this is all safe and we can move ahead. Uh, it is, you're right, there is that component of cost. Uh, this is a free service, obviously, and we do try and facilitate uh, physio and psychology engagement with the patient, but it's more in a group program, undertaking a group treatment program rather than individual. Yeah. Thank you. Um, some other questions from the audience. So what is the current wait time and what is the cost? You covered the cost. So um, what is the covered current wait time 
for say the seminar, I suppose, as the first step? Mm, so after referral, we receive a referral from the GP. We then invite the patient to uh, contact us to book themselves into the, uh, the next available uh, seminar. And that's anywhere between six to eight weeks at the moment. Uh, and often there is um, space. So I have known people who have been referred here and within one week they're into the introduction, introductory or welcoming seminar. Uh, and then from there, it would be another six weeks, possibly six to eight weeks, uh, wait for the um, assessment program. And then from there, it might be a roughly two months period there to the active treatment program. And that's all dependent on the patient opting in. So we notice that um, as part of what the issues is with patients engaging their services, often the patient's desire to attend. We know they have some difficulties. Also, they might be working. There's other commitments. So we recognise that we want to fit in with the patient's timetable and getting them to opt in often gets the best buy-in to the service. Uh, so it's if the patient delays, 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 obviously, therefore, it's um, going to be longer to get in. Uh, if GPs are finding that patient's been waiting too long, then it could be that there's been a miscommunication or the patient was unaware they need to contact us. I mean, we are able to be contacted by the phone and we can then sort out those sorts of issues quite quickly and get that patient involved or into the program very soon. So some of that is maybe understanding that unlike a lot of other referrals into um, Hunter New England Health, that you know this this has a different pathway, and so 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 you know at the point of referring, it's useful to have that that understanding, isn't it? Um, yes, of particularly the patient, uh, you know, taking more responsibility and engaging with us and and organising mm. their own time schedule, which day they'd like to attend, uh, and also you know they can attend with a support person as well. Uh, the the information sessions as well as some of the uh, assessment programs are done on the webinars as well, so they don't need to attend in person at John Hunter Hospital. These are all options that they can discuss once they ring back. Great. And um, just about um, who can refer. So we had a question about who can refer. Is it um, solely GPs or medical practitioners, or is there you know another referral pathway from other professionals? I'll just the, um, the particular ask, question was asked from pharmacy, but um, just uh, more widely. We we, we would uh, I I'm not 100% certain on that. I'll ask Fiona in a second. But I'll, I think from a personal point of view, we would prefer that the GP is involved with the uh, referral. The the issue there is that when even a, a specialist refers it, to our service, which they do, is it it seems to have left out the important person, which is the GP. And we find it very difficult to uh, engage with a patient who uh, hasn't, the GP has been left out in the step. Um, okay. So I would feel that the GP is the predominant person. And I would say that um, if, if someone is uh, wanting referral, then talk to the GP. If some other allied health professional or pharmacist or nursing or, or whoever else feels that this is an important step for the patient to undertake, asking the patient to discuss it with the GP about a referral would be, I think, the most appropriate step. Okay, thank you for that. Now, um, there's also a question about the Central Coast now. So, so you, hips and tips, of course, um, as well, are Hunter New England. Um, do you take referrals from outside of the Hunter New England footprint? Is there a similar service on the Central Coast? Uh, there, there was a similar service of sorts, but I believe that's not, um, uh, I think there's a long wait list and I'm not too sure about what they are doing at the moment. However, we do take referrals from out of area, um, but, you know, uh, I suppose we, we want to know, you know, why that is the case, because coming from out of area that um, produces another barriers, there's transportation, uh, obviously, and there's uh, maybe other issues there that need to be addressed. Um, however, we uh, are able to, you know, facilitate, and if it's appropriate, then we contact the service in that area and to see if there's some way that uh, that person can get more local care. Um, it might be initial meeting with us, and uh, organising some local allied health area, um, sorry, persons or professionals in their area to help facilitate their regular, you could say, contact and treatment. 
Um, so, but yes, we, we do, we have, and we continue to take referrals from out of area. And then this is quite a long question. So um, do you have any suggestions for how to manage patients who aren't ready to engage with pain recovery and treatment, but are highly distressed? And I think this is probably something that speaks to a lot of GPs. Despite yes. taking lots of time and what I would deem to be good communication, I find that when I try and address, address other factors like mental health, they still feel like I'm not addressing the underlying issue of the pain and they're seeking biomechanical treatments. Mm. Um, well, this is a, a difficult thing for anyone. Um, the issues I, I can only imagine because I'm not a GP. However, uh, we we are luckily allowed some extra time here in the tertiary centres to, and also our colleagues here are able to support us in in opening up those conversations in a manner that allows uh, non-judgment and uh, the person to maybe give an opportunity to address some of those um, factors that you highlighted. How do you manage it yourself? I think the first thing is is always is to make sure it's not you don't take on that problem that that this is a, a patient that you're supporting, and we know that people aren't ready at different times of their life and and that's okay as long as the patient is reasonably safe and they're um you could say uh, displaying distress and then your right is is to then support the person with with whatever techniques that you have evolved over time with your practice, uh, but also holding your boundaries. So part of the need to help support people is, is also not to cross a boundary that you feel is probably not the appropriate treatment. Uh, giving, there's plenty of evidence looking at um, ways that we prescribe, doctors prescribe, and often the prescription comes because of the stress rather than the actual function or the pain. Um, mm. So it's, it's sometimes working out, okay, how do I, um, support myself and also knowing my boundaries, but also maintaining a firm boundary to the patient and an understanding and empathy, uh, tying all those together to know that the patient is validated, but these are the reasons why we aren't doing this, but this is the reasons why I would recommend that. And then leaving it to the patient to work out, okay, how these are my options, I suppose. But it is a difficult, very difficult thing when the patient's sitting in front of you solo. I, I do know that it feels very uncomfortable for me at times. But I think uh, um, what we said earlier about, you know, using the model and being able to explain that model maybe starts to give you some more avenues towards, you know, making little inroads or planting seeds for the future, you know. But yes, but definitely. That idea yeah. that, you know, everything doesn't have to be solved in one consultation and that um, if we can start to plant some ideas about, other ways in which we could tackle the pain, I suppose that's, um, yeah, that's producing that, that we can definitely hope. do in primary care. Yes, producing hope, I think, in the patient that there's other options and they uh, opportunities to recover. Uh, I think that's uh, a very important to highlight in the patient who's distressed and feels hopeless and, uh, and lost. Yeah. Hmm. Well, thank you, Andrew and Laura. I think we're pretty much out of time. So I will just invite Jenny to join us again, just to wrap up. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the HIPS team and thanks, Michelle. You always have a good way of um, getting the most um, important points across to everyone. Um, I've just um, shared Sandra's screen. Are you there, Sandra? She's um, just showing the Health Pathways login. It's not on the right screen, Sandra. Here it is here. Uh, did you want to quickly say something, Sandra? I thought I was off mute, but I'm off mute now. <laughs> um, this is the login details for the Hunter New England Community Health Pathways. Um, there's a QR code that you can use to scan with your phone to, to get on quickly. Otherwise, you can just dot, jot down the details for those people who are unfamiliar with Health Pathways. Um, and I saw one of the questions around how do you refer in. At the bottom of the chronic non-cancer pathway, the links through to how to refer into HIPS are there. Um, we, as, as was pointed out, we have a... Um, a opioid deprescribing pathway and these were both written in collaboration with Chris Hayes um, and we've also got a cannabis medicines pathway that was written by the Sydney Health Pathway team. So enjoy. <laughs>
Great, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming today. Um, I did put in the chat, remember this is an accredited event um, and the PHN will upload your points, but make sure you fill in the evaluation and put in your RACGP and or ACRAM number at the end. The evaluation will just pop up. It'll take you 30 seconds to fill in. Uh, and we'd love to hear um, from all our allied health uh, registrants and pharmacists and whoever else is on as well. All right, thank you everyone, and I'll see you all next week at part two. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.